So good evening, everyone, and uh, we welcome you all to this um, uh, co-branded uh, webinar by um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology and uh, CPOEM, uh, which stands for Clinic uh, for Creative Portal for Oncology Education and More. And uh, the topic for today would be on the optimal sequencing of treatment in metastatic colorectal cancer. And I'm Dr. Vishwanath S. I'm a senior medical oncologist uh, with Apollo Hospitals in Bangalore. And uh, uh, we will uh, just talk about uh, a few words about our housekeeping instructions. So uh, please ensure the internet connectivity is good to have uh, a seamless experience. By default, all the attendees will be in mute and listen only mode. Attendees can also choose to ask questions by typing in the Q&A section. And uh, this session will be recorded. A few words about our uh, creative portal for oncology education more, which stands for CPOEM. It is a not-for-profit uh, organization tasked with the uh, education of practicing oncologists and trainees and a portal for increasing access to patient resources and improving awareness globally. So this webinar series is the third of the uh, four webinars uh, which we have organized, and it is co-branded by the American Society of Clinical Oncology. So uh, the planning committee members includes uh, myself, uh, Dr. Vishwanath, uh, Dr. Santosh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at MS Ramaya Hospitals in Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Rachan Shetty, who is a senior consultant medical oncologist with uh, AJ Hospitals in Bangalore, India. Uh, Dr. Chandrakant, uh, consultant medical oncologist uh, with Narayana Deyalaya Hospital in uh, Kolkata, India. And Dr. Poonam Maurya, uh, who is uh, my colleague in the same department, and she's from Apollo Hospitals in Bangalore. So the agenda for today uh, includes a talk by uh, Dr. Anand Ramaswamy on newly diagnosed metastatic colorectal cancer uh, treatment option, uh, sec and then followed by another talk on second line and beyond treatment options in metastatic colorectal cancer by Dr. Kanwal Pratap Singh Raghav. And then we have two case presentations by Dr. Chandrakant and Dr. Rachin Shetty. And then we have concluding remarks and summary by Dr. Santosh Kedi. We have two eminent oncologists as our session chairs today, Dr. Biswajit uh, Dubashi from uh, Jipmer in Pondicherry, India. Dr. Andrea Sersek, uh, who has been kind enough to accept our invitation, and she's uh, a GI medical oncologist from MSKCC uh, in the United States. And uh, uh, it's myself, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Rachin, Dr. Chandrakant, and Dr. Poonam Maurya are the planning committee members for this webinar. Uh, to introduce our uh, first uh, speaker, I request Dr. Biswajit uh, Dubashi, who is uh, uh, one of our chairpersons for today is to introduce Dr. Biswajit. He is a professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at uh, Jipmer Pondicherry, and uh, he has done his uh, hematology oncology training. Dr. Vishwanath, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think Dr. Anand is having some trouble joining. So okay. if you could have Dr. Uh, Raghav speak uh, first, and uh, meanwhile I'll figure the uh, problem there. Okay. So uh, in that case, I would request um, uh, Dr. Sersek, uh, who is the uh, section head uh, of colorectal cancer, co-director um, and uh, sent at the Center for Young Onset Colorectal and GI Cancers at the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Center. Uh, she has also done her hematology oncology training from the same center. And uh, she's received several honors and awards and her focus is mainly in colorectal cancer appendicular cancer and cholangiocarcinoma. I have joined in, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Okay, perfect. In that case, anyway, I will uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Sersek, who is our other chairperson, and she has numerous publications in high-impact journals. She is also the founder and co-director for the of the Center for Young Onset Colorectal and uh, GI Cancer. And um, uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Andrea Sersek. And uh, I request Dr. Biswajit to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Anand Ramaswamy, and we apologize for the technical glitches. Over to you, Dr. Biswajit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwanath. Good evening. Uh, and uh, thank you to Dr. Santosh and the organizers. 
Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Anand is my uh, colleague and uh, we have been in close association with multiple projects. Uh, Dr. Anand is a professor in the Department of uh, Medical Oncology at TMH with a special interest in uh, GI Oncology. Uh, Anand, welcome uh, to the meeting and uh, uh, you can uh, uh, start the uh, proceedings. Uh, the topic uh, allotted to you is on um, uh, the first line treatment in metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. Great. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. And um... Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Vishwanath and the organizers for inviting me uh, to this CME. And I think good morning to our colleagues in the US as well. Uh, so over the next 25 to 30 minutes, I've been tasked with talking on newly diagnosed metastatic colorectal cancer. It's a large topic, but um, these are some of the points that I will try and cover over the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll start with, uh, you know, a basis that uh, the regimens of choice over the last 15 to 20 years um, in terms of a chemo backbone have been Folfox, Kpox, Folfiri, and very rarely Pi FU. And the doublet regimens have proven to be largely similar in terms of efficacy um, over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. Um, post the advent of Folfirinox, uh, you know, there were approximately four to five studies which suggested a PFS benefit and an overall survival benefit with uh, uh, Folferinox or Folfoxiv, as it is called in some places. And that led to an increasing usage of this regimen across trials as well as clinical practice. Now, um, there was a meta-analysis that was done approximately two years back of approximately 1,700 patients and they included, you know, five large trials which had compared folfoxiri or folfirinox with a doublet regimen with or without targeted therapy. And um, the, as you can see, excepting for maybe uh, more right-sided cancers in the folfoxiri group, most of the uh, trials had well-matched data. And very clearly, there was around a four and a half month difference in overall survival when you used um, a fall for a firinox in compared to the doublets. And this was primarily, the, uh, you know, um, it was primarily because of the results of the Olivia being as strong, even though it was one of the smaller trials in the scenario. But it also comes at a cost. You know, it's important to remember that in this meta-analysis, approximately 80% of patients were PS0. And uh, that is not what we routinely see. A majority of our patients are PS1 or PS2 also. And um, you would not be able to probably deliver Folferinox in this setting. It also comes at the added cost of uh, significantly increased toxicity in the form of myelosuppression and diarrhea. So while you want to look at improved survivals um, and intensify therapy in uh, metastatic colorectal cancers, uh, there is also a cause for de-escalation at some point in the continuum of management of advanced CRC. And this is important because you need to be um, aware of the fact that we need to maintain quality of life. And a significant proportion of colorectal cancers are uh, in the older age group, seventh decade or so. And uh, when we give more than four to six months of you know, intensive chemotherapy, especially with oxaliplatin, you can have neuropathy, which we know is debilitating. And um, another thing that we often forget is that, you know, caregiver and patient treatment related fatigue, caregiver burden are real issues. So while you need to intensify in some scenarios, um, over a course of time, there should be, you know, a, a look at de-intensification as well. And this is where um, studies like the Optimox one, the Cairo and the Focus trials uh, uh, laid the foundation for a de-escalation of sorts. So this is a snapshot of the data where uh, a degree of de-escalation was considered or de-intensification. The best example would be the Optimox 1, where you give six cycles of Folfox and then, you know, maintained with 5FU as opposed to continuing Folfox till progression. And very clearly, there were no differences in survival. And there was a definite reduction in neuropathy. 
Optimox 2 took that further in terms of stopping treatment. That did not work out as well because it did show that maintenance 5 you had some benefit. And the Cairo 3 again stopped chemotherapy K-POX after around six cycles. So all of these approaches did show that continuing chemo beyond four to six months in terms of an intensive regimen may not be as relevant. The recently published Focus 4 also stopped treatment after only four months of chemo. And while there was a difference in progression-free survival of approximately two months, the overall survivals were not different. So just as a point to remember that, you know, we can use Folfrinox or Folfoxyre in patients who are very fit, but largely the backbone remains a doublet chemotherapy, which could be Folfox, Kpox, or Folfrinox. Uh, continuing intensive chemo beyond four to six months may not provide very relevant improvements in survivals and maintenance strategies for, such as FIFU and CAPE with or without targeted therapy is probably the way to go after four to six months of um, intensive chemo. Uh, but chemotherapy is one part of, of you know, how we treat our patients. The bigger talking point is uh, how we are using precision oncology in terms of uh, using targeted therapy with chemo. And while there are a number of uh, guidelines, I kind of like what the um, ESMO Precision Medicine Working Group came out with. Uh, they essentially said that, you know, you need to do RAS, RAF, NTRK, and HER2 for sure. And this is just a lift, uh, list of the most other common mutations and alterations that you see. Uh, while a number of us probably do NGS in uh, before treating advanced colorectal cancers, what the ESMO said was that since most level one alterations are hotspots in KRAS, NRAS, and BRAF, you not, need not have an NGS in daily practice. However, if it's not too expensive, you can consider an NGS, and this would, of course, allow detection of things like HER2 and MSI with greater accuracy. And definitely in centers where there are a number of clinical trials, NGS is an important part of uh, our management of colorectal cancers. Um, in terms of uh, treatment, treating brass mutant tumors, um, in the first line, you essentially have a single drug, bevacizumab. Now, um, except for the first study, uh, which evaluated bevacizumab uh, plus chemotherapy, um, which was the AVF-017, uh, most of the studies with BEV have shown us a difference in progression-free survival. There's not been a really unequivocal benefit in terms of overall survival, but in the RAS mutant space, probably this is the only drug that we can use currently. Uh, most of the discussions get interesting when it comes to RAS white type tumors. And, uh, you know, that is where sidedness and, and the use of BEV versus anti-EGFR directed therapy comes into play. And this is just an um, easy snapshot as to how to guide therapy in clinical practice. Um, for those of us who've been treating GI cancers over the last eight to 10 years, uh, you know, from 2014 onwards, there was this big debate for two to three years almost when we talked of sidedness as being the determinant of therapy. Um, it is important to note that per se right-sided uh, advanced colorectal cancers probably have lesser outcomes compared to left-sided, irrespective of therapy. Uh, this is related to a number of reasons, and uh, probably it's just not sidedness, but the fact that it's biology acting via a surrogate in terms of sidedness. Um, this was best explained, I think, by the CMS classification of colorectal cancers in the seminal paper in 2015, where they clearly differentiated um, a large number of colon cancers into four subtypes, CMS1, CMS2, CMS3, and CMS4. <laughs> the easy way, I think, beyond the multiple aspects of this paper is to remember that CMS4 and CMS1 probably have the worst survivals, while CMS2 and CMS3 do well. Now, if you go back to the earlier diagram, CMS1 is most common in the right-sided cancers, 
and which is probably why these cancers do as badly. Um, very clearly, the CMS subclassification showed that uh, if, if you look at CMS4, the green lines in the curves, their survivals were probably the worst in terms of frequency survival and overall survival. While in those who uh, uh, had their survivals were measured after relapse, CMS1 as also did not do well. So it's not a question of sightedness, but you know, more likely biology, which um, determines outcomes. Uh, coming to RAS wild type tumors, there have been a number of studies, but I've just shown three of the important studies where um, you looked at the addition of anti-EGFR directed therapy to chemotherapy. And if you look at the trials themselves, they were also a learning curve in terms of how we treat these patients. For example, Pristil had an unselected population, Prime had a KRAS wild type, and Taylor had KRAS and NRAS wild type. This just goes to show that um, it's not only enough to do KRAS, we probably need to do all RAS before selecting our treatment as anti-EGFR directed therapy. Even in these earlier trials, Pristil and Prime, there was a clear signal that Probably this kind, the anti-EGFR directed therapy worked only in the space of left-sided cancers, not so much in right-sided cam uh, cancers. And this was best highlighted in these two, you know, hugely discussed trials uh, in 2014 and 2017, the FIRE 3 and the CalGB SWOG 80405 where one trial said that there was a difference in survival when you added anti-EGFR. The other one said no. And this was discussed ad nauseum four to five to six years back. But essentially, the uh, important parts of these two trials is, is in this slide, where um, they looked, uh, where you can see the data from the FIRE 3, the CalGB, as well as the PEAK. Very clearly, in left sided cancers, you should use anti EGFR directed therapy. And the difference in overall survivals was around seven to 10 months. Not so much of a survival difference in terms of progression-free survival, where the difference in survival was around one to two months only. But very clearly, in right-sided cancers, the addition of anti-EGFR therapy did not help. And uh, in, in the CalGB study, actually, um, the difference in survival was you know, almost twice as much when you used BEV. Um, so a couple of things. Um, in terms of what is the quantum of benefit that you expect when you add anti-EGFR directed therapy, even in the best selected population. Uh, this is one of the um, uh, parts of the Cairo Phi trial, whose idea was to look at the better downstaging regimens. But uh, an indirect uh, answer to our uh, uh, question as to what is the quantum of benefit is also seen in this trial, where um, in terms of median PFS, when you used uh, anti-EGFR directed therapy versus BEV, there's not much of a difference. And there was no difference in the important um, um, endpoint of R0 or R1 resection rates as well. So um, there was this suggestion that even in right-sided or left-sided cancers, if you wanted downstaging, uh, you know, anti-EGFR directed therapy probably provides more downstaging. That may not be the case as shown in this uh, analysis, of, analysis of the Cairo 5. That said, I think the single best trial to answer the quantum of benefit with left-sided cancers in RAS wild type is the Paradigm study, a uh, well-conducted study, although uh, they made multiple changes in their statistical endpoints during the course of the study. It very clearly said that uh, when you use anti-EGFR-directed therapy in terms of panitimab, you have a three and a half month difference in overall survival. Uh, and, and this was quite a large study, so it probably gives the answer to that question of uh, RAS, um, RAS wild-type left-sided cancers. Um, uh, last bit on the RAS wild-type, since Paul Freenox is an effective regimen in um, um, most colorectal cancers, should you combine anti-EGFR therapy to Paul Freenox? And the answer likely is no. Uh, this is the data from the triplet Gono study. 
and uh, there was no difference in overall response rates as well. So if you're using anti-EGFR therapy, you're probably uh, going to go with a doublet regimen. Uh, this is just some of the points. Remember, uh, right-sided metastatic colorectal cancers do have inferior survivals. Um, in patients with RAS mutant tumors, you would want to consider the addition of BEV. And in right-sided tumors for biology and the data suggests that anti-EGFR tumors do not work as well in right-sided tumors. So you again add BEV. And in left-sided tumors, there is a reasonably relevant OS difference when you add anti-EGFR therapy in comparison to BEV. Uh, coming now to uh, some of the uh, um, molecular subtypes of, of colorectal cancers. Um, BRAF, um, we know that BRAF mutant, BRAF itself is a highly prognostic uh, uh, indicator in, in uh, colorectal cancers and to some extent predictive as well. Uh, you know, it predicts for probably inferior outcomes when you give anti-EGFR therapy. Uh, you have far more BRAF mutants on the right side, um, almost 20% in hepatic uh, flexure tumors. The thing to remember with um, BRAF mutant tumors is that not all BRAF mutant tumors are bad. Um, it always makes sense to classify them based on their kinase activity, RAS dependency, and dimerization status. Class one is, uh, is the garden variety, most commonly B600E, and class two and class three have lesser activity. Now, besides classifying these BRAF mutants, their importance probably lies in the proportion of these tumors. This is data from uh, three very large data sets from uh, the Mayo, MD Anderson, and Foundation, where you can see that, um, you know, of this many tumors, probably 10% are BRAF mutants. Around 80% of them are BRAF V600, and 20% are, um, are um, non V600E. And it's important to note that while we say that BRAF V600E has very poor outcomes, the non-V600E probably have good outcomes. And so it makes sense to subtype these all the time with, uh, instead of clubbing all the BRAF mutants together. Um, since it is a small number in terms of, um, um, you know, how many BRAF mutations we see in practice, uh, most of the early data was based on subset analysis of trials which were evaluating chemo. And as you can see here, um, if you use only chemotherapy, you probably have uh, a progression-free survival for around six months. And that too with an intensive regimen like Polfirinox plus BEV. Um, and the overall survival hovers around one to one and a half years. But most of, as, as in most other tumors, we are moving towards the use of targeted therapy in uh, BRAF mutant tumors as well. This is some of the early data with the use of predominantly targeted therapy. This included BRAF as well as MEK inhibitors. Uh, it was the SWOG study, the uh, studies by Corcoran et al. as well. Again, the important thing to note here is that the progression-free survivals as well as the response rate when we used these combinations was very middling. Um, in fact, if you use bemurafenib and cetuximab in the SWOG, the response rate was only 17%, and the progression-free survival was only four months. Similar data was seen when you combined dabrafenib, trametinib, and panitumab. Your progression-free survivals did not improve too much. It, of course, has to be noted that these most of these studies looked at uh, heavily pretreated cohorts. So in this space, I think, the most important um, trial was the Beacon. At the time of its publication, it was heavily criticized, discussed, um, but we often forget that uh, since it's such a rare uh, subtype of colon cancers, the authors also need to be congratulated for doing this study of 600 patients. What the study did show was that when you combined um, a BRAF inhibitor with a MEK inhibitor and anti-EGFR, you had a survival of around nine months. And probably um, the MEK inhibitor did not add too much. So a combination of encorifenib and cetuximab, probably in pretreated BRAF mutant patients uh, was good enough. 
And this probably set the stage for um, the anchor study, which is the first line study. It was a two-stage design study where they looked at the combination of uh, encorifinib, benimentinib, and cetaximab. The primary endpoint was overall uh, response rates, and the study did achieve that. Again, um, despite it achieving the response rates, the PFS was only six months. So again, it just uh, underlines uh, what an aggressive cohort of tumors we're dealing with. Even the overall survival was uh, one and a half years which is less than what you would expect in the current era in non-BRAF mutant tumors. This study also sets the stage for uh, the breakwater study, which is currently ongoing. So um, a couple of points to remember, um, BRAF is definitely prognostic and predictive. Not all BRAFs carry are bad. You know, some of them have good outcomes. If you have access to targeted therapy, I think that would be the way to go in the future. Else, Polfirinox and BEV is probably the most effective regimen. Um, another subtype, um, HER2 amplification is the old, new in terms of it's been around for years, but you know, you're know you having data only coming up over the last three to five years. Um, it's seen in approximately five to 6% of stage four colorectal cancers. It's definitely predictive. Um, if you're going to use anti-EGFR therapies, you probably will not have as good a response in a HER2 amplified tumor as opposed to a HER2 non-amplified tumor. Um, they usually are mutually exclusive to RAS mutations, and they are common on the left side of the colon. Um, this is a snapshot of, of the data that we have currently for HER2 amplified tumors. Um, important to note, these are all trials in pretreated patients. It starts with the Heracles A, and over the last two years, we've had some good data, exciting data, with the uh, deruxetecan as well as the trastuzumab plus tocatinib data. The trastuzumab plus tocatinib data is especially interesting because uh, the overall survival there in a pretreated setting was almost two years, which is which is quite excellent. So currently. Uh, you would not, uh, you don't have any recommended um, uh, first-line targeted therapeutic options in her two positive cancers, but I think that's going to change. Um, in, if you're treating patients uh, with RAS wild-type tumors, it makes sense to do her two. Uh, it gives you an idea of um, what you're expecting from treatment. And uh, importantly, I think most of these uh, her two uh, our trials are looking at combination as opposed to monotherapy. And I think that is the way we will be treating um, these cancers in the future. Um, going on to one of the last uh, parts of my talk in terms of tumor subtypes is MSI. Um, it's seen around 4% of all colorectal cancer patients. Uh, a simple IHC is generally good enough and it has good correlation with a PCR or an NGS. And we probably shouldn't forget to check for Lynch when we have MSI high tumors. Uh, this is the big study, uh, the Keynote 177, uh, which e evaluated two years, almost two years of pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. Uh, it was a 300 patient study. And very clearly, um, the study achieved its primary endpoint. Um, the progression free survival was 16 months, and it was eight months with chemotherapy. The um, thing to watch out for is that almost 25 to 30 percent of patients were hyperprogressors with pembrolizumab, and that is something that we need to look at uh, as as treatment improves in these patients. Uh, the overall survival data was also released some time back. Um, there was no difference in overall survival, um, though the three month survival rates in both arms was quite good. It was around 50 and 60 percent. And that is primarily because uh, almost 40% of patients were allowed to cross over to Pembro and another 20% of patients uh, received another checkpoint inhibitor. So essentially, despite the lack of OS benefit, I think this is a standard of care in MSI high patients. Um, this is just the other uh, um, checkpoint inhibitor, uh, NIPO plus EP. Uh, it actually had very uh, impressive response rates of almost 70%, and this was in the checkmate 142. 
Um, so probably that's one way to go in these cancers, but uh, as of now, pembrolizumab would be the standard of care. I've also included the data of the Atizo tri uh, tribe, uh, which was a first line study in MSI unselected or predominantly MSI stable patients. And, and they had some interesting results in terms of their overall survival and progression free survival as well. Um, so um, pembrolizumab is definitely the standard of care in MSI high patients. The thing that we need to evaluate further is what of those 30% of patients who probably have primary resistance, uh, do you combine um, uh, PDL1 with anti CTLA4? Is it based on PDL1 expression, low TMB? Uh, these are things that are talking points as we go into the future with this subgroup. Um, this is uh, treating older patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. We forget often that this is a cancer that is predominantly seen in the seventh decade. In India, it's probably seen a decade earlier, but at least in the West, your average age is going to be around 65. Um, a comprehensive geriatric assessment should be a part of the management of these patients. Uh, we run a clinic in TMH, and an eyeball physical assessment is not the best assessment. And, you know, it should be physiological age and uh, things that are picked up on a CGA that should determine treatment as opposed to only chronological age. Um, this is a very simple study that was done in Denmark, the Jericho trial, uh, where they evaluated uh, patients with colorectal cancer, uh, where they looked at providing these patients with CGA-based interventions versus standard of care. Um, the list of investigations they have, um, evaluations they have done is what you would normally do in a CGA. And um, the results were interesting. The primary endpoint was how many, what proportion of patients actually completed planned treatment. And that was much higher in, in those who underwent a CGA. And you also uh, had a reduced need for chemotherapy dose reductions when, when you um, randomized patients to the geriatric assessment arm. So, uh, this is something that we should consider when we treat our older patients with cancer. Uh, in terms of actual treatment regimens, um, just like in adjuvant therapy, when we use Folfox or Capox, patients uh, more than 70 do not benefit too much with the addition of oxaliplatin. You have two trials, uh, one a decade old trial, which was the MRC focus and a recent paper from Japan, where they clearly showed that if you give 5-FU or capecitabine, that is largely similar in terms of outcomes in older patients or patients who are frail or patients with an ECOG PS, which is borderline too. The other interesting study in this space is the TASC-01, where they looked at uh, TASC-102 plus BEV in patients who were loosely classified as ineligible for intensive therapy. Again, it just goes to show that you don't need to give too many intensive regimens in this population to achieve reasonable outcomes. Um, yeah, so I think older and frail patients are often not included in large phase three trials. That's almost unfair on them. They should be included in these trials. We should do a GA in these patients and probably oxaliplatin is not very useful in this age group of frail patients. A quick look at some Indian data. This is what the treatment pattern for patients in India looks like. A majority of our patients would, you know, have a profile similar to uh, patient B where they do not have access to targeted therapy or, or uh, immunotherapy. Um, in a patient who has access to therapy, you would expect a survival of around three to three and a half years. In our setting, probably it is lesser. There's very limited data from India. There are um, only two um, uh, large data sets published from the All India Institute and uh, my institute. And if you can see, the median survivals over around one and a half years. And this is likely because of the lack of um, a number of treatment options being available to these patients. Likely, if we go to uh, uh, non-governmental centers, these survivals would be better because of access to treatment options. Uh, I've not covered a lot of things because it wasn't possible. Things like uh, CRS high PEC, how do you treat oligometastatic disease, 
downstaging CTCs is very exciting, but you know, I had only 30 minutes. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and uh, back to the chairpersons and organizers. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Anand, for that talk and I request Dr. Biswaji to summarize and give us comments. Uh, thank you, Anand, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think uh, you have uh, summarized beautifully. The first part of your talk was on the uh, triplet versus uh, the doublet. And uh, you're clearly shown uh, that the triplet has is superior to doublet, but we need to be cautious uh, in terms of toxicity. The second part of, I mean, the next part of your uh, talk was uh, basically on the subtypes on the uh, different uh, CMS one, two, three, four. And uh, then you discuss something on the uh, EGFR inhibitors and the uh, uh, bevacizumab, uh, especially in the uh, uh, all RAS wild type, where there's always a confusion uh, which we need to uh, use. Uh, then uh, subsequently move towards the uh, BRAF inhibitors, uh, then something on the HER2 uh, amplified tumors. Uh, then uh, uh, you did something on the, uh, you did tell us something on the MSI high tumors. And then finally, uh, the geriatric uh, patients. So I think you summed up uh, very nicely the first line uh, part of the metastatic CRC. Uh, just let me see if there are any questions uh, in the uh, QA, but I can't see uh, any questions there. So I'll start off with two, three questions, and then I'll ask other uh, experts uh, to uh, get, get some questions there. So my uh, first uh, question uh, to you is, again, for the you know, students and for everyone uh, in Indian setting, when will you use a, a triplet regime when compared to a, a doublet regime? Uh, we predominantly use it in extremely fit patients with right-sided tumors. Um, that's that's the almost the only place where we use it. In terms of, let's say, if we have 100 patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, probably we'll be able to use it only in around 20% or so, not more. So um, if you have a fit patient um, and it's a right-sided tumor, you always use a triplet? No, sir. Even there, or, a majority of our patients are not fit enough for Falfirinox. So uh, it, we stick to our doublets plus bevacizumab if it's feasible. Around 20% of my patients would come up for a triplet regimen. Uh, Dr. Biswaj, and, and your take on the BRAF, because uh, we do not have uh, targeted therapies available, BRAF mutation. So would you consider doing a triplet for all BRAF mutations? For sure. If they are fit enough, uh, it is important to know that even with the triplet, the survival is less than one year. Or they're thereabouts, 12 to 14 months with BRAF mutants. But yes, if they are fit enough, I would consider Falfirinox plus Bevacizumab. Yes. Uh, Dr. Biswajit, can we take the questions during the panel discussion? I mean, during the case discussion? All right. Sure. Sure. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. you. can go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Biswajit and Dr. Anant Ramaswamy for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, now we move on to the uh, next talk. We request our chairperson, Dr. Andrea Sersek, to introduce the second speaker. Hi, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and, and colleague, uh, Dr. Raghav, who will give our, our next talk. So he's an associate professor in the Department of GI Medical Oncology um, at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. His initial medical training was in India, and then he pursued internal medicine and residency at Albert Einstein Medical College here in New York, and then subsequ subsequently completed his HEMONC training at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, he's received several awards, including SWAG Young Investigator Award, um, many clinical investigator awards, has numerous publications, uh, and has been the principal investigator on really uh, pivotal clinical trials. So um, take it away, Dr. Raghav, looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's so nice to see you. Um, Anand uh, already covered a bunch of what I needed to do. Uh, so this is going to be a really uh, easy talk for that uh, perspective. I was given the task of uh, discussing second line and beyond treatment in 30 minutes. I think that's a little unfair with regards to time because these are uh, you know big topics, but I'll try to uh, do the best I can. Um, can I, I can share my screen, right? Yes. Not... Okay. Let me know once you can see my presentation in the appropriate mode. Perfect. You can? Okay. 
So we're going to talk about second line and beyond. Um, and, you know, from the previous talk, it was quite clear that cytotoxic chemotherapies uh, are, are, are a major uh, way in which we treat um, colon cancer, at least in the first line, right? Once that first line is done uh, so far, uh, we start recognizing that colorectal cancer is not one entity, but a group of heterogeneous uh, entities that behave very differently. Some patients respond very well to first line, others don't respond very well to first line. And even within clinical presentation, there is a lot of um, uh, variability. So when you actually look at the genetic and molecular profile of cancers, you realize that colorectal cancer is very heterogeneous when it comes to its molecular profiling. The larger groups, of course, are the deficient mismatch repair MSI high group and then the MSS stable group. But even within those groups, there are various pathways that are driving this cancer. Um, in general, whether it is first or second line treatment, uh, the armamentarium of drugs that we have against colorectal cancer still tends to cluster around the same cytotoxic chemotherapies because a lot of those are used in uh, you know, second line unless you've used a triplet cytotoxic in first line. Um, and then you have VEGF, anti-EGFR, uh, and uh, antibodies. Um, targeted therapies against BRAF, HER2, uh, immunotherapy if you've not exposed the patient already to first-line immunotherapy, and then some salvage therapy regimes like regorafenib and TAS with or without BEV, in addition to rechallenge and reintroduction of prior lines of chemo. So this is the current NCCN guidelines. I'm gonna emphasize less on non-targeted uh, therapies because the general principle is if you use the oxaliplatin 5-FU based treatment in the first line, your second line cytotoxics becomes an irinotecan based treatment combined with a biologic, unless you have a molecular subset and vice versa. So if you used an irinotecan moiety before, you use um, an oxaliplatin uh, chemo. Also, there is a group of patients that get now based triplet cytotoxics, and, uh, and that means that once they progress on that first-line treatment, they will move on to either targeted therapies or salvage-line treatments directly. The last salvage-line, uh, or, or what we classically call salvage-line treatment, is either regorafenib or TAS-102, uh, which is sort of like the new improved 5-FU, with or without bevacizumab, and we know that the response rates are less than 5%. So we, before we reach that stage, we always want to find uh, clinical trials for patients because even though these therapies may be effective when, it com uh, when compared to placebo, these are not the optimal outcomes that we are looking for. So in overall, in second line or third line setting, these this is our current landscape, right? So you have uh, immunotherapy for MSI high or deficient mismatch repair tumors. The number of tumors are about four to five percent. Response rates though very high, forty five to fifty five percent, sometimes reaching up to 60, 70 percent if you use a doublet cytotoxic as a doublet immunotherapy. Then you have the HER2 amplifications that happen in about 2 to 3% of all colorectal cancers. And this is there, the response rates are close to 30 to 50%. And you have two lines of treatment, dual anti-HER2 inhibition, as well as anti-HER2 uh, antibody drug conjugates. We talked a little bit about BRAF in the prior talk, 7% uh, to 8% prevalence of this biomarker, 20 to 25% response rate from uh, the beacon regime in like that uh, second line setting. And then you have this really small proportion of, uh, of tumor agnostic approval for NTREC fusions. These are found in less than 0.5% of, of, uh, of patients. Um, and I'd love to know uh, Andrea's uh, experience on this, but even though we treat a large number of patients, I've only yet, as yet treated two patients with NTREC fusions that have colorectal cancer. Uh, and, uh, you know, both of them had actually a mixed response. So I haven't seen the kind of responses that we've seen on the, on the clinical trial. But still, it's very targeted, fusion-driven uh, tumor, and the response rates can be as high as 80%. 
So let's talk about immunotherapy and get that over with. Uh, in today's world for colorectal cancer, you should be treating all patients with MSI high deficient mismatch repair tumors in first line setting. If you haven't done that, then uh, then we need to revisit those processes because you should be testing these patients early on and starting everybody on immunotherapy. Yes, there is a group of patients that we do not know as yet who progress right through immunotherapy, and we are not exactly sure who that group is, but still, in an overall proportion, the risk-benefit profile of immunotherapy far outweighs the benefit that you would get from chemotherapy in this setting. Uh, but in case uh, we miss the board and patients come to a second line setting, immunotherapy should definitely be employed, right? And these are the trials and they speak for themselves. You can see uh, in the pembrolizumab uh, study that started this all, MSI high or mismatch repair, deficient colorectal cancer had a 40% response rate. And more important than actually the amount of response, is that spider plot that shows the durability of these responses. Some of these responses last forever. In fact, so much so that we've started using the word cure for many of these patients. On the contrary, one of the most important things to emphasize is when you have a proficient mismatch repair tumor, it does not respond to immunotherapy, right? So 0% response rate, and you can see that almost all of those patients progress right through the screen. Right. So this is uh, a very potent single agent anti-PD-1 uh, activity. Similarly, nivolumab in second line study also shows a 55% response rate. And again, look at that 12 month progression free survival, almost 77%. Remember that the median survival for first line chemotherapy is sort of six, about six to nine months in, uh, in colorectal cancer. Uh, escalation of that immune checkpoint inhibition to dual immune checkpoint inhibition with nivolumab and ipilimumab has never been compared head to head with single agent anti PD1. So it's hard to, uh, hard to pick one over the other. However, as a general rule, what we see is that the objective response rates are higher with nivolumab and ipilimumab. Uh, including the depth of responses that change. And I apologize, I think that that legend is switched up because the objective response rates are 55% with nevo ipi compared to 31% with nivolumab in general. Uh, in clinical practice, uh, the way to look at this is if you have a, um, a, a well-to-do patient, a, a well patient who has, uh, who can tolerate the potential side effects of added dual immune checkpoint inhibition, Nevo and IPI would be the uh, go-to choice or in patients that have large disease burden and you really need a tumor response. Uh, however, it, as of today, it is very difficult to choose between uh, either one of those treatments because of a lack of randomized data. I also want to emphasize on this data, which is sometimes gets ignored, and this is the data of immunotherapy in MSI stable, uh, sorry, uh, MSS uh, tumors or microsatellite stable cancers. This was a large randomized trial comparing regorafenib to cobimetinib and atezo, which generated a lot of buzz. Uh, but it's interesting to note that there was an atezo arm in this. So it's a large group of uh, MSS patients that have been treated with atezo. And you can see that those curves literally overlap each other and there is very little benefit of immunotherapy uh, in, this, uh, in this population. If anything, the progression-free survival with regorafenib actually shows that there is a subset of patients that benefit from regorafenib overall uh, compared to IO. It is also important to know that not only is the response rate really, really low in these patients or negligible, PD-1, PD-L1 testing is not a biomarker for this. So I have seen that in clinical practice, a lot of patients get PD-L1 testing in colorectal cancer, and they treat patients who are MSS stable with immunotherapy, and that should not be done because there is no uh, data that supports the use of PD-L1 as a biomarker, at least in colorectal cancer, outside of MSI high uh, colon cancers. Now going on to uh, salvage therapies, and there are basically two drugs that we use uh, in these lines. One is regorafenib, the other one is TAS-102. 
One is a targeted therapy, which is the promiscuous multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The other one is uh, chemotherapy. Um, and these are the two different mechanisms of actions. And the choice between those two drugs uh, essentially centers around toxicity profile. Uh, it centers around, uh, you know, uh, what the patient has received before and, and overall uh, what the performance status of the patient is. Uh, the correct trial, which was the regorafenib uh, trial uh, against best supported care uh, against placebo in a two is to one randomization, uh, uh, showed uh, an improvement in overall survival by 1.4 months of median. And you can see that the median PFS improved. Uh, the response rate, however, did not improve. In most cases, this is a cytostatic drug. Uh, there is an increased disease control rate with this drug. So there is a value for this drug. However, uh, as you can see, that the, uh, that the um, median improvement in overall survival is less than inspiring. Similarly, the recourse study was done for TAS-102 versus placebo. Very similar study. It did allow prior regorafenib treated patients. The primary endpoint was overall survival. And in this randomized uh, data, again, improvement in overall survival uh, by about uh, uh, one point some months. Um, you can see that the PFS improved. Again, no major changes in response rate. Overall, this is again a cytostatic picture. The disease control rate improved 44%. But these drugs have their own toxicities. Regorafenib has toxicities of fatigue, diarrhea, uh, hand foot skin, uh, skin reactions. Uh, whereas TAS-102 uh, can be highly myelosuppressive. So uh, we all know that uh, anti-VEGF continuation in colorectal cancer beyond first line, as evidenced by TML, the lower studies, and uh, also the uh, bevacizumab studies have shown that, you know, as you continue VEGF inhibition in colorectal cancer and attach it to any chemotherapy, it still provides some clinical benefit. And hence, this study was done for patients who were TAS eligible, were given TAS and DEV. And you can see that, you know, uh, the, in the clinical characteristics for this randomized trial, the sunlight trial, uh, a lot of patients had prior bevacizumab. They had about 72% patient had prior anti-VEGF. Uh, but however, it should be remembered that neither the quantity of VEGF exposure was stratified in this, patient, uh, in this population and about 30% of patients did not have prior VEGF uh, treatment. And, uh, and you can see that there is some increased toxicity for adding that, uh, that uh, VEGF agent. However, the primary endpoint of this study was overall survival, and the study measures primary endpoint and improved overall survival uh, of about three months over, uh, over um, long serve by itself. And, and now this is the standard go-to uh, treatment for all patients in the salvage line setting over and above TAS-102, unless there is a contraindication to giving VEGF inhibition. Last but not the least, a lot of, pa uh, lot of patients undergo this kind of re-challenge, reintroduction of prior uh, therapies. Re-challenge is when somebody has actually progressed on a treatment. Reintroduction is if you took them off treatment to give them a chemo break, but they've never really progressed on it. And uh, there is a smattering of retrospective, uh, I would say low level evidence that shows response rates that are anywhere between 6% to 38%. However, uh, an argument can be made that this uh, response rate is probably not very high uh, for as, or as definitely as high as 30% because the GERCOR experience which was full theory and full FOX sequencing taught us that after first line treatment where the response rates were 44, 40 to 50 percent, the second line response rates of either of those regimens falls down uh, significantly uh, to about 15 and 4 percent respectively. So the second line response rates are less than inspiring for uh, chemotherapy. Again, this will never trump clinical trial uh, and looking for clinical trials. This is an option for treatment. Um, uh, however, uh, you know, rechallenge should be reserved for select patients who are still uh, retaining their performance status and have tolerated treatment properly. Now we come to targeted therapies. And uh, when it comes to targeted therapies, I'm going to concentrate mostly on, uh, on two uh, mechanisms. One is the BRAF mutations, 
and one is the uh, HER2 am uh, amplifications. There is also a newer uh, group that is being developed, which is the KRAS-12C, uh, which has been successfully targeted, uh, but, uh, uh, but as of yet not FDA approved, and therefore uh, uh, we'll keep our discussions restricted to these two uh, pathways. Bottom line, both these pathways affect the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, you know, this is the this is a common uh, commonly targeted pathway in colorectal cancer because anti EGFR agents uh, work against this pathway. And as would be the case, uh, you know, anti EGFR antibodies will not work in either RAS mutant or RAF uh, BRAF mutant or HER2 amplified tumors because all of these can provide uh, signaling. Uh, either downstream or as a crosstalk uh, to the same uh, pathway. So when we talk about BRAF mutations, uh, we've already discussed this. BRAF mutations are not all alike. When we are talking about BRAF, we're talking about activating BRAF mutations, especially BRAF V600 or class 1 and class 2 mutations. When you look at non-V600 mutations, they are not as prognostic, but BRAF V600 mutations are extremely prognostic and patients do very poorly. In this biomarker analysis of the PRIME study, it is quite clear when you have uh, no RAS mutation, so BRAF wild type, but BRAF mutant patients, whether you give them anti-EGFR or you give them full FOX, their progression-free survival is about five months, and their overall survival is about nine to 10 months compared to 20 and 28 months when you do not have these mutations. So this is a group of patients that should be identified early. In fact, if anything, first-line treatment uh, should be uh, targeted, uh, and this is ongoing in the current uh, uh, breakwater study. But this is the Beacon uh, 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 trial, which established BRAF inhibition along with EGFR inhibition as a standard of care for BRAF even metastatic colorectal cancer. It should be remembered that there were trials that were done with single-agent BRAF inhibition. Uh, however, that was not very successful in colorectal cancer with response rates of less than 10%. And the reason why this happens is because whenever you inhibit BRAF, your EGFR gets upregulated. So the obvious answer is to actually inhibit both those. And then the third option was to actually inhibit it in triplet fashion with vinimetinib, uh, which was the MEK inhibitor. These are the results of the trial, and you can see these are two cur curves of uh, median overall survival of triplet versus the control and the doublet versus the control. Either ways, when you look at the control, you can see the overall survival in second line setting is extremely dismal, just about five months. But when you look at the triplet and the doublet, there is some improvement in overall survival, not very inspiring, but definitely a four month improvement in survival. Uh, however, the doublet and the triplet do pretty much similar. So when you look at response rates, you see a response rate of about 27% with triplet, 20% with doublet, and only about 2% with control, also highlighting the fact that these tumors tend to be very chemorefractory. Um, so th this trial has formed the basis of the FDA approval for uh, encorafenib and cetuximab, uh, only the doublet, not the triplet, for BRAF uh, V600 mutated patients, and the phase three breakwater study uh, using this regime in first line setting is currently ongoing. Now, coming to HER2 amplification, this is the new kid on the block. It's less understood. Uh, it is seen in about two to three percent of all colorectal cancers. Uh, however, mostly enriched in RAS wild type colorectal cancer, where it can be seen in about six to seven percent patients and about 1% cases in a RAS mutant uh, population. This is critical because uh, in RAS wild type population where this uh, amplification is found mostly, we use anti-EGFR therapies. Uh, this was a study that uh, showed uh, that when you treat patients with anti-EGFR uh, on, uh, on like the top panels, these are two independent cohorts, uh, what you find is that the PFS with anti-EGFR based treatments was far less in HER2 amplified patients, about two, two to three months, versus HER2 non-amplified patients where it is about eight to nine months. However, this amplification is not prognostic uh, to date, and also uh, it does not affect a VEGF or a non-anti-EGFR based treatment for the obvious uh, mechanistic reasons. A smattering of uh, 
prospective smaller trials have shown that dual anti-HER2 inhibition is very successful in metastatic colorectal cancer. By dual anti-HER2 inhibition, I mean two drugs that inhibit HER2. This was the Heracles A trial, which used trastuzumab, lapatinib. Then in Europe, you can see highly treatment refractory population with an objective response rate of 30%. All these patients were KRAS Y type. Uh, and you can see that the median OS was about uh, 10 months. And uh, most of the patients who had a response had IHC 3 plus. Uh, the next trial was my pathway. This used a monoclonal antibody uh, combination, which is pertuzumab and trastuzumab. Again, highly refractory population. You can see that the two lessons to learn. Number one, when you use it in a RAS wild type population, dual anti HER2 uh, inhibition is very effective, response rates of about 40%. However, this study uh, enrolled KRAS mutant patients uh, who also have HER2 amplification. And you can see that the response rates uh, were, you know, was only seen in like 1%, one patient, which is 8%. However, I would argue that this should this strategy should not be used for RAS mutant um, um, colorectal cancer that is HER2 amplified. Uh, this led to the uh, large random uh, well randomized but non-comparative uh, mountaineer study where they used tucatinib and trastuzumab in uh, a single arm uh, study design and then was randomized to tucatinib trastuzumab and then tucatinib by itself. And, uh, and this has led to the first FDA approval of a HER2 targeted agent in metastatic colorectal cancer, which is tucatinib in combination with trastuzumab. You can see that the response rates were as high as 38%. Uh, one other lesson to learn from this is single agent anti HER2 therapy, which has been proven with preclinical evidence, does not work in colorectal cancer because patients on tucatinib arm only had a response rate of 3.3%. But these responses were also long lasting uh, and the duration of response was over 12 months. Uh, furthermore, this therapy is fairly well tolerated. Great three side effects were seen in only about 38% uh, population. Uh, SWAP1613 was an, an a randomized trial. It failed to meet its accrual, but uh, it randomized trastuzumab, pertuzumab against cetuximab, irinotecan, trying to answer the question whether giving anti-HER2 therapy is better than giving an anti-EGFR-based treatment. You can see that uh, the numbers are small here, so the PFS was not very different. But in the exploratory analysis of the study, it was clear that HER2 amplifications tend to occur like a, a spectrum, where on one end you have low-level amplifications that may benefit from anti-EGFR therapy, but it does not benefit from dual anti-HER2 inhibition uh, on the other hand, there are high HER2 amplifications that tend to benefit from HER2 amplification and unlikely to benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. Uh, HER2, uh, just like in breast cancer, has multiple uh, ways of targeting it, and this is the HER2 uh, antibody drug conjugate, uh, uh, transtuzumab deruxtecan. Uh, this was uh, investigated in Destiny CRC01 study at 6.4 milligram dose in only a RAS wild type population, but then later on expanded into the randomized uh, Destiny CRC02 study, which investigated a lower dose against the 6.4 milligram dose, but also allowed KRAS mutant patients. Uh, and you can see that in this randomization, we were trying to investigate the 5.4 milligram dose specifically because of the increased risk of interstitial lung disease. Uh, confirmed objective response rate was the primary endpoint. Remember, the study was not powered to statistically compare the two arms. So this is the 5.4 milligram per kg arm, which is the one that is now recommended for colorectal cancer. And you can see, again, in a highly treatment refractory population, your response rates uh, are close to uh, 38%, uh, very similar to dual anti-HER2 inhibition. Uh, there was also a disease control rate that was uh, approaching 90% and the median duration of response was about 5.5 months. A uh, couple of things to learn from this uh, trial is number one, this, uh, this type of uh, strategy is effective in RAS mutant population as well as RAS wild type population contrary to dual anti-HER2 inhibition which is only uh, effective in uh, RAS wild type population. In addition, 
even patients that were treated with prior HER2 therapy uh, received benefit from an antibody drug conjugate uh, treatment. Um, and with that, I will stop. I think I'm just slightly over the, the, uh, the time period I was given, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Raga, for that excellent and very comprehensive talk. So I'll just briefly summarize some key points, and then we can jump into the case presentations and questions. Um, so you spoke about second line and beyond in metastatic colorectal cancer, which obviously has had a lot of exciting development. And you touched first on uh, MSI high uh, patients and stressed the importance of testing um, across the board you know, for MSI, because we have great data for first line treatment with immunotherapy as well as second line and beyond in this in this population including single agent and and doublets um then you talked a bit about the um other potential um biomarkers driving therapy in second line and beyond which include her 2 BRAF and and NTRAC and and uh, I would agree with you with with NTRAC it's incredibly rare I've only seen it myself in two patients and those they were both MSI high. So um, it's a marker we have, we look for it, we do testing, but it's, it's quite, it's quite rare. Um, so in terms of non, non-targeted and non-selected populations, you discussed uh, the data available for regorafenib and, and TAS-102 and the modest, um, albeit statistically significant, um, overall survival benefit in, in both studies uh, with both drugs of about a month and a half. Um, and then interestingly, um, you also touched upon the you know, rechallenge and some of the, the smaller studies and some of the smaller data um, out there for rechallenging patients uh, with standard chemotherapy. And I'd be interested to hear how that approach is, is done in India where there is less a biomarker targeted therapy available. Uh, but it, as you described in the United States, we don't tend to, to do rechallenge so much because we do have other clinical trials or targeted therapies available. So then moving on to, to targeted therapies, the, the two more important, and, and as you stated, um, FDA and NCCN approved BRAF and HER2 targeting um, in second line and beyond. So the BRAF study, really the beacon study, as was discussed in the first talk as well, showed a benefit with doublet therapy. So targeting EGFR and BRAF uh, in, in overall survival, modest benefit, but still significant uh, and is certainly a standard approach now. And we're awaiting to see if that will be beneficial in, in first line, as you discussed. Um, and then in her too, um, I, you know, exciting new kid on the block for us, recent approval in second line and beyond of uh, dual targeted therapy uh, with trastuzumab and tacatinib, so TKI combinations, you outlined the earlier studies, and then the more recent study that really showed a significant um, response rate in this population, as well as a really, um, you know, profound um, survival benefit um, in importantly, as you said, HER2 amplified RAS wild type patients. So these patients really need to be HER2 amplified and RAS wild type if they're to receive a dual um, TKI inhibition. Um, and, and then um, for those that are not in HER2 amplified tumors, we do have the ADCs and you show the data of TDXD or in HER2 uh, where we see similar um, robust responses and, and benefits. And these can be applied to patients that are um, RAS mutated. And the data shows also that they, they can be beneficial in patients who have received prior HER2 targeted therapy. Um, so that's really the, the more exciting things that are that are ongoing now, and then you briefly touched on, on KRAS G12C, which is obviously in clinical trials um, worldwide and, and not, but not yet FDA approved. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sasek, uh, for those valuable comments. And um, we move forward uh, more to the case discussion and uh, I request my co-host, Dr. Santosh, to take over from here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwanath. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, two talks, and uh, uh, we'll move on to the case presentation. And we have Dr. Chandrakant, who is a senior medical oncologist working in uh, Narayana Super Speciality Hospitals in Kolkata. Uh, he will uh, discuss uh, uh, a first line uh, situation um, and uh, maybe touch upon second line if time permits. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Raghav and Dr. Sarsak uh, to uh, be part of the discussion. I think Dr. Anand had to uh, rush somewhere. Uh, we'll try and see if we can get uh, hold of Dr. Biswajit to log in again. 
Okay. So thank you, Dr. Santosh, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it was really good to hear Dr. Anand and Dr. Kanwal, and it was very well summarized uh, by Dr. Sarsek. You know, what I didn't understand, I understood after hearing the summary. So let me share the slides. I think the slides are visible and I'm audible also. Okay. Yes. So, so I have 15 minutes to go and I'm supposed to ask targeted questions and targeted discussions. And I will start with Dr. Sarsek and then Dr. Bishwajit and Dr. Kanwal. So I will go in the sequence. So let me start. So these are real cases and I've kept them short. I have not put pictures and confused things and I've kept them straight. So this is a 60 year old gentleman. He's a minister. So minister like he's, he's sort of a leader. So he has no comorbidities. Uh, he's diagnosed with a moderately differentiated right colon cancer with multiple unresectable liver and omental metastasis. Okay. So we usually do in our hospital because we have an in-house PCR. So we do KRAS, NRAS and BRAF by a PCR uh, method. So, so Dr. Sarsak, uh, uh, so how do you, in the, in the present day, we have targets beyond RAS and RAF. There are so many other targets. So what do you think? Is it a time to show a transition to an NGS and also the liquid biopsy? So you can take up both of these questions. Sure. So I think the ideal time uh, for NGS, really for everyone, is first-line therapy, if, if at all possible, actually before initiation of first-line therapy. Um, a a right-sided tumor in a 60-year-old could be MSI high, and that would inform immunotherapy versus standard of care chemotherapy in this situation. So we really try our very best to do NGS. Um, we have an in-house panel, but many centers, uh, you know, send to, to other um, companies that do full NGS sequencing on the tissue. If tissue is not available, biopsy is challenging, um, then certainly liquid biopsy can be quite helpful. Um, in at least at least answering the question of of MSI or MSS. Um, otherwise, I think it's it's okay to do a liquid biopsy, but it would not affect uh, treatment. And you know, I would not monitor um, CT DNA, let's say, as as a men's mechanism of response here in a in a first line setting. I would use typical imaging, et cetera, to monitor response. Excellent. So what I can understand is we must try and do next generation sequencing on tissue for all our patients whenever there is feasibility. If the tissue is not available, only then I would do a liquid biopsy. I think that is what we can sort of conclude. Okay. So now this patient was MSS. You know, I think probably I've missed that uh, writing in that. So this patient went on to take Kpox plus bevacizumab because this was a right-sided cancer. We did give bevacizumab. The patient did have a partial response and had a grade two peripheral neuropathy. And then he uh, he went on for four more cycles of capacitabine plus bevacizumab maintenance, upon which he developed new onset liver and lung nodules. Okay, so I will again go to Dr. Bishwajit. So, Dr. Biswajit, uh, your take on whether would you have used an EGFR on the right side? And then do you believe is right and left a right way of classifying colon or it's not just sidedness, it is more of a molecular subtyping? Uh, I, I can't see Dr. Biswajit online. Okay, then I will request Dr. Kanwal. So, sir, can you please uh, take up this question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, love to hear what Andrea has to say about this too. I mean, there's no concept of like believing or not believing in the left versus right side story. I think there's enough data to suggest that there's, these are, you know, different uh, tumors and, and, you know, even adjusted for molecular alterations that at least we understand so far 
there are differences between these two, right? So, you know, the paradigm trial, for example, was um, left-sided tumor, uh, sorry, uh, RAS wild-type tumors adjusted for appropriate biomarkers between left, uh, left and right-sided and still showed survival benefit. Uh, from anti-EGFR in left-sided tumors, right? So uh, I, I think that uh, that I do believe the story. I think left-sided patients generally tend to benefit more. And therefore, my I, I always try to bring anti-EGFR as far up in their uh, treatment continuum as possible. I cannot say for sure that we have enough data to suggest that right-sided tumors do not benefit at all or that they have worse outcomes when you give them, but we often do not treat right-sided tumors in first or even second line treatments. I mean, I might use it for a, like, uh, you know, a, a last line approach if I have nothing else left, but, uh, but definitely not in first or second lines. So do you yeah, feel what, that what you, yeah. do you uh, at MSK are you treating any right sided patients or no or only in select cases? No, so I would agree with you completely on on right sided. We don't tend to treat any right sided uh, tumors with anti EGFR therapy, unless, as you said, you are you know really out of lines of therapy, clinical trial is not available, then perhaps you, you might try it. But but just biologically, it doesn't really make sense given the, the data in, in first line that, that it would work. Um, in, in left-sided tumors though, you know, there does appear to be benefit, um, but we tend to still save anti-EGFR therapy for later lines um, simply because had the initial studies of anti-EGFR therapy with panitumab versus best supportive care been hyper-selected for all RAS, there probably would have been a significantly higher um, overall survival benefit. So it's it's probably, you still get that survival at the end. Um, and, and I think it's mostly quality of life and toxicity from the rash limits sometimes using it, using it first line. Okay, so uh, the right and the left was mainly based on the PCR, but in the era where if I am able to do an NGS on that issue and also send a liquid biopsy, and I don't see any mutations that sort of interfere with anti-EGFR activity, okay? Then, even then, do you think right and left still holds good in the present day? And what about the CMS? You know, there are four types of CMS, and in that, only a particular type of CMS sort of is resistant to anti-EGFR. So, I mean, these right and left are just surrogates of an underlying molecular pathway alteration or they are inherently, you think they are different. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure, they, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you that, you know, uh, there has to be a molecule, there has to be a mechanistic basis of the difference between right and left. What, what I was trying to say is that I do not think that your molecular profiling as of date captures that entire gamut, right? So remember, when you do NGS sequencing, you're still capturing only the genomic compartment of the cell, right? There is a transcriptomic compartment of the cell. Okay, maybe you'll do a CMS. Maybe that will give you that data. But even then, you still have mechanisms such as, you know, you have the post-translational modification in proteins, you have metabolic signatures, you have adaptive resistance that comes in, and how right and left deal with that could be completely different, right? And so there is certain, certain truth to the fact that molecular, uh, molecular profiling captures some of this, but doesn't just capture the entire DNA. Understood. So, right, left still is the gold standard because we are not able to pick up all the existing mutations which are resistant. In probably, right, left is a standard, and we need to think in those lines, even in the era of NGS. I think that is what we can conclude. Okay. So now this patient, uh, uh, we did a liquid biopsy at progression. <clears throat> this uh, came out to be a RAS mutant with a WAF of 0.02% and an APC of 10% and a P53 of 2%. So, uh, Dr. Andrea, again uh, to you, 
So do you would you do liquid biopsy in Cologne? And when would you do? And any comments on the WAF? What WAF is significant for you? And you were just mentioning on the super selection part. So how do you look at the super selection in the present era? So this is a quick question. You know, I think the the question here has to do with clonal versus subclonal as well in this in this population. And I I missed it. Did did this person receive uh, anti EGFR therapy? I apologize. No. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so so this is where I, I would be really curious to see what what Kenwell says about this. But um, you know, I would I would have to go with the the tissue sequencing and not the liquid biopsy here for clinical decision making for sure. Um, I mean, you know, because even the paradigm study, I mean, we can talk about it forever in terms of their, you know, their ctDNA uh, evaluation. But just personally, I think we're we're learning about ctDNA, but there um, there's a lot remaining to be learned. And so I think in this case, I would really trust the the tissue sequencing and keep it simple. I think that's I I, I would totally agree with this. What limit of VAF VAF would you consider significant? Is a question that I don't think anyone has an answer to, right? Like um, CTDNA is an evolving field where I think the technology has far uh, exceeded the science of it. Uh, so you, you are seeing some data come out where they're saying that subclonal RAS mutations may still benefit from anti-EGFR. Uh, I think, uh, you know, like I was saying for amplification, we always used to consider mutations as a very binary concept. Uh, but it seems like now that we have a quantitative aspect to it, you know, and this is far beyond clinical practice, but now that we have a quantitative aspect to it, there is a spectrum there also, right? Like, you, you know, what you're seeing in this probably reflects some subclones if, if it doesn't represent chip or anything abnormal, right? Okay. And the question is, what would be the greatest benefit uh, from an anti-EGFR therapy? However, as of today, there is no data to suggest that you should use a VAF of 0.02% to not give somebody, um, you know, um, anti-EGFR. Anti if this was a left-sided patient with the tissue testing that was RAS wild type, RAF wild type, HER2 negative, and had this molecular profile, I would still go ahead and give them anti-EGFR and I would love to see if Andrea would do the same. Yeah, agree completely. Great. I think we also did the same, like we did not give relevance to that. And we did give uh, 12 cycles of uh, full free plus ituximab. The patient did respond. And then again, went on to take six cycles of 5FU plus ituximab and then developed progression. I think the first question is already answered. Okay, so the second and the third question, is there any preference of an one anti-EGFR over the other? If there is a history of bevacizumab exposure, and would you prefer full free? I mean, some there is an issue with platinum and cetuximab. Do you believe that, Doctor Sasek, You can take that up. Um, no. So I would have given anti GFR post progression. I don't prefer one to the other. We tend to so in New York. In southern uh, United States and the south, uh, patients have hypersensitivity reactions to cetuximab, so we tend to use more panitumumab for that reason. I don't believe there's any difference in, in efficacy, and you know we'll, we'll switch out the data, for example, with encorafenib and cetuximab and use panitumumab, and that's very we're very comfortable with that one or the other. Um, and I... I tend to prefer just reflexively full theory with cetuximab, or as I mentioned, I sometimes do cetuximab even in the third line, you know, with just Irino Tecan as my as my clinical practice. Um, but but so that's that's usually would be my approach. But I think you know nothing is wrong in colorectal cancer; anything goes. For if the you, most part. Uh, what about what about full fox with cetuximab? You don't like that combination. No, because I don't. I tend to use Fulfox as first line, and often, you know, if I use any, I would use a bevacizumab, and so um, I don't tend to to use Fulfox okay. in combination with cetuximab. But that being said, we, you know, we have data to support it. It's a perfectly fine option. Yes, yes, understood. Okay, quickly going on. So this patient uh, has K-pox, Bave, K-Bave, 
four free C two four five few C two exhausted. Now still has grade one peripheral neuropathy. Okay, so Doctor Kamal again difficult. I mean, like patient is there and the patient had has been a quite a long platinum free interval. So would you re-challenge with platinum in these patients? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a way of looking what is platinum free interval, uh, right? So what is your platinum free interval here? You gave four, so two months plus three months plus three months, right? So essentially eight months of platinum free interval. Um, you know, in ovarian literature, you would, ovarian cancer literature, you'd see that, you know, at least Six a months. year out yeah. is considered a good platinum free. Um, you know, First of all, it is not a re-challenge of full Fox. It's actually a reintroduction of an oxaliplatin-based treatment because the patient actually never progressed on it. I think yes. it's a very reasonable yes. re-challenge. Um, I would try to uh, still, um, you know, go ahead and try other established things. Uh, I think tri uh, TAS 102 plus BEV would be a good option. It depends on how the patient has tolerated your full fee cetuximab. Uh, do you want to give them a little bit of a chemo free interval? What is the PS? You know, I think either either one of these options is very reasonable. Um, it'll depend on patient situation. So you would prefer TAS with bevacizumab, right? Like in the presence yeah, of Yeah, I mean, if I give if, if I give Lonserf, I would give it with bevacizumab. But like the question is, like after you know nine plus six 15 months of chemo what are their blood counts really doing and if you're if you feel that the blood True. counts can that's one or two i would definitely give that yeah agree agree okay i think we had a good discussion okay quickly going for the second uh, case dr chandrakant uh, uh, it was a wonderful yeah, discussion i think we should okay okay done, done. um we will move on to the next case because just purely because of lack of time um thank you um thank you for that uh, Dr. Rachan, uh, we will go ahead with the next uh, case presentation and discussion. Dr. Rachan is a, a senior medical oncologist uh, at uh, AJ uh, Medical College and Hospitals in uh, South of India in Bang in Mangalore uh, and a good friend. So over to you, Dr. Rachan. Yeah, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the host and all the eminent panelists. So this is a real case which we see in the day-to-day -day clinical practice. A middle-aged man presented with anemia and loss of weight and on evaluation was found to have a sigma growth and the PET CD scan showed extensive bilobar liver mats with multiple peritoneal uh, this uh, paratic lymphadenopathy and the CA was 120. Limited colon NGS panel which is available in India was sent. Teras, Lira, Fenras was wild type. I've not mentioned Lira, Fenras. It was wild type. MSI was stable. HER2 was negative. So my question would be, what would be your intent of uh, treatment in this case? Bilobar, extensive liver mat with multiple uh, parietic lymphadenopathy. To Dr. Anjay Sarkar, madam. So uh, Dr. Rachan, uh, Dr. Andrea just uh, had a, an emergency. So the discussion will be with uh, Dr. Uh, Kanwal, the last last case. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think, so you're saying the bilober is extensive, yes, uh, extensive bilober. And there is also extra hepatic disease. Yes, extensive liver meds, obviously. And the uh, choice of regimen, whether uh, full fox versus full free and uh, full free not. And what targeted therapy would you choose? A left sided tumor, BEV, versus an NT GFR. And among NT GFR, CETIC C versus panitizumab in your clinical practice. Okay. So, in interest of time, let me answer this quickly. First of all, I never comment on curative or palliative intent unless or uh, until I've seen the scans myself. But I'll believe you, Dr. Rachan, in saying when you say extensive, you're, you're saying that this is undesectable disease, in which case my intent would be palliative, right? Uh, but but you know, extensive disease and resect liver resection has become a very relative term nowadays because uh, we've done like two stage, three stage hepatectomies to you know take care of a lot of disease. But yes, mostly the answer is it should be palliative. Um, yes. In terms of the choice of regime, uh, I'm presuming the patient's PS is good. Yes. And sorry, PS what was the age of age again? Years. What was the age? 52 years fit. 
Okay, so I would choose full serenox. I always choose a triplet as a default, unless and until there is any contraindication. I'm worried about that, right? Even if I have to dose reduce it, I always choose a triplet. I cannot tell you the targeted therapy of choice right now because this is sigmoid colon and you haven't tested for either BRAF or uh, NRAS mutations. So I would do that before I would challenge somebody with anti EGFR. So in that, case you, you are not able to, in case you're not able to, I would use bevacizumab first and I would use anti EGFR in a second line setting, right? But the way I always look at it is I come across this question many times that there is not enough tissue or that you can't spend enough, like there's not enough money to get testing done. But frankly, the amount of money and the risk that you take with somebody's life when you give them chemotherapy far exceeds the amount of resources that would be required to do a good panel testing, right? Especially even if it is just a blood sequencing. And if not blood sequencing, then I would just do a biopsy and get, you know, uh, targeted you know, tissue testing before giving somebody anti-EGFR. But if you just don't have anything and you're hedging your bets against probability, then what you're saying is, oh, if somebody's KRAS wild type, the chances of them being KRAS or NRAS other mutations is less than 17%. So sure, I mean, like that's another way of like looking at it. Um, so I would give cetuximab in that case, but for the first line, I would choose BEV and Polterinox. Thank you, sir. Actually, uh, so I, I had uh, we had thought about using Polyphenox, but uh, it is uh, uh, didn't choose. And in fact, we had done uh, tested for Keras and Viraf. It was uh, wild type only. There was no mutation. Started on Folfox or Pantimumab for four cycles, and reassessment uh, PET was done, which showed complete uh, disappearance of liver metastasis and sigmoid growth uptake was also reduced. And CA had dropped to single digit number that is about six, uh, six nanograms. So in this setting, what is the role of surgery? Uh, because even though there was extensive bilobar liver mets and the multiple uh, parotid and iliac nodes, all, all had disappeared. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I see. Okay, so your current scan and your previous scan. So you have a lot of vanishing liver metastases, right? Um, yes. Unfortunately, I don't think that uh, that that one picture does justice to it because yes, I would really yes, like correct. to see the entire thing. Uh, given that spread of disease, I think biologically this patient is not a great candidate for surgery. So what I would do is I would do a test of time, right? I would de-escalate his chemo, put them on chemo for a little bit, uh, sorry, maintenance for a little bit and see how the disease biology reflects itself, right? You've only had like two months of disease control. So it's not like you've done a, a bang up job. Four months, four. four months. Four months. I see. I thought I thought it was four cycles. But okay, four months. So I would I would just keep uh, keep him on some maintenance and see what happens. So uh, yeah, we continued two more cycles uh, of full fox and uh, the CA started rising. And the repeat PET CD scan showed extensive liver mats and new onset lung mats. So if immediately his chemo was changed to whole free plus bevacizumab for two cycles, that is uh, uh, basically uh, cycle one and uh, day one and day 14 of cycle one. So even with that, the CA was rising. So this is uh, this was took me by surprise, like uh, this responded very well and they started uh, not responding to second line treatment. So what would you do? Like, would you repeat a NGS panel, uh, extension NGS panel, and what what would be the next treatment option? Uh, TAS one or two versus uh, regorapeni versus S one. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I think I would repeat uh, a garden profile or a or a you know Natera profile or tempers or whatever CTDNA. I mean, I wouldn't re biopsy this patient just for this. Um, I'm not a big fan of changing treatments so quickly just based on CA biomarkers. I don't, I don't believe that that really helps uh, unless and until your patient is not tolerating treatment, in which case it doesn't really matter what the CA is. Um, because you lose valuable time and sometimes you don't know whether two cycles are sufficient enough uh, for any kind of uh, assessment. And, and again, CA rising from 27 to 29 is very different from 27 Actually, to 500. Uh, rose from 27 to 60. I have not put it 
rose from 27 yeah. to 60. It was almost doubled. Right. So after that, yeah, I mean, I think if you don't have any targets, either they got after them or their, their task would both be reasonable. It all depends on like how the profile is. So again, we got uh, given option about uh, this one, uh, Regora Phenip, uh, because of the toxicity started on S1 versus uh, uh, Tipirasin. Uh, but on S1, he has a uh, grade 3 diarrhea, but CA is continues to rise slowly. So, what I mean, this we have discussed already, we are regarding re challenge. So, my experience with re challenge is uh, not very good. I have uh, tried re challenge with the uh, Cold Fox and Cold Free, either ways. So, considering regular FNA at present. Thank you, sir, for a very uh, extensive discussion. All this uh, has been already discussed. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Rachan, um, uh, for uh, uh, a nice case uh, to discuss. There are just a couple of questions in the chat box. I would read out uh, Dr. Kanwal. Uh, uh, he, with this first question uh, is uh, thinking of default triplet chemo in a newly diagnosed patient. But would you be uh, uh, of if we, what about uh, further lines of chemo? If you use up all the chemo uh, options in the beginning only, what about further lines of chemo in a palliative setting? That's a, that is one question. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know the 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 depth of response and the more responses you get from first line chemo justifies that the tribe two data and the tribe one data show that these patients were treated with second and third line chemos and there was still an overall survival benefit in the select population right so i think if a patient can tolerate it uh it is better to you know use up all your cytotoxics early on and then, of course, you know, you, you go to maintenance uh, quickly, but, you know, you can imagine that the depth of the response and, and the durability of response increases when you use that. So, so I don't think that there is a survival difference. There's not a lack of survival, right? Clearly, that was shown in a randomized trial. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it was a, quite a convincing answer. Uh, the last question is um, for follow-up in patients uh, who are treated with curative intent, either with surgery or chemotherapy, would you follow them up with a PET scan or a CT scan? A CT scan unless and until contraindicated. Right. With IV contrast. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kanwal. The other faculty, Dr. Rachan, Dr. Chandrakant, uh, for a wonderful discussion. I'm sure uh, we are quite uh, enlightened a lot uh, about metastatic colorectal cancer. Uh, All right, thank you. And thank I thank ASCO uh, for uh, uh, supporting us in this endeavor of educational webinars. And uh, all the uh, participants who uh, have uh, stayed through the webinar from India and all around the world. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.